As we continue this series called King Saul's Lessons, last week I opened it up by talking about King Saul, and we learned one major lesson from King Saul, and that's this, insecurities can ruin destinies. And it's so important to deal with our insecurities so that the Lord can use us and that we don't fall short. And this is week two of our series called King Size Lessons, and it's called just simply this, have a heart, have a heart. Elbow somebody and say, have a heart. I think that's an appropriate title for Mother's Day. Guys, uh, I have a house that came with a pool. And if you're ever considering putting a pool in your house, think again. Not in your house, outside your house. Definitely don't put it in your house, but you, you don't even want a pool around. Uh, I know you think, man, it would be incredible to have a pool. Do you have any idea how much maintenance and care? I'm telling you, it is a money pit. I just, just, it just sucks in money. Well, this pool has just given us so much trouble. So we bought a cover for our pool. And so we said, you know what? In the wintertime, we're just going to cover that thing up. And just, just, just let whatever happened, happen. And, but you know, there's a process of closing a pool so it doesn't become overgrown with algae and green nasty stuff. Well, at the end of last year, I closed the pool down, put the, put the cover over the pool and everything looked great. And two weeks ago, I said, you know what? The weather's nice, let's pull that cover off. Let's pull that cover off. And I, I pulled the cover off. Guys, this is the nastiest water you've ever seen in your life. It all looked great on the outside. Everything looked perfect on the outside, but when I pulled that thing out, it was nasty. And then I heard something rattling in the skimmer box. I know y'all think I'm gonna say it was a snake, but I, I was scared to open up the box because it, whatever it was, it was, it was living and it was big. And so I opened that box, and guys, it was a squirrel had found his way into the skimmer box, and, and, and dude was mad. He came up out of that skimmer box, ah, like, like he was going to attack me. He ran up, 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 up a tree, but I just thought, what a mess. And so I've been on a journey for the last two weeks to purify my pool, and I've, I have bleached it. I have shocked it, I have vacuumed it, and I know I'm gonna get emails from you pool experts out there that, oh, I could have dealt with that in two days. This is all you had to do. I'm just telling you, this thing was a mess. And I had to get up in there and, and try, to, try to figure it out. I have good news to announce to everybody today that I'm on the final leg of purifying my pool. And I'm hosting a pool party for the whole church to come. No, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding, just kidding. No, but, but I'm almost done purifying the pool. And you know, that image comes to my mind when I think about our hearts. Guys, it doesn't matter what we look like on the outside. We can have all the stuff going for us in life, but only the Lord knows what's on the inside of our hearts. And when I talk about your heart, I'm talking about the things that you love, I'm talking about your passions. I'm talking about your ambitions and agendas. I'm talking about your motives, why you do what you do. And lesson number two is that, is that God is looking at the heart for everything. So I recently read about a huge corporation that surprises people when they come in for an interview. People will come in with these huge resumes and in the interview process, they'll say, you can set that resume to the side. And they give them a wild question that the person didn't expect. And it's how they can problem solve and how they think. And it has nothing to do with their resume. And this company is actually looking for something so different than what they thought. And brothers and sisters, here's my word to you today is that promotion doesn't come from the east or from the west. It comes from the hand of the Lord. And how does God choose who he uses? and how he elevates and who he walks with. He's exclusively looking at the heart. The world is looking at your resume, your experience, what you've accomplished, and God is looking at your heart. And so here's the message, is that we don't focus on our hearts enough. 
We don't turn the mirror in enough to say, what's actually going on under the pool? What is growing in my heart? What's lurking in my heart? What pride is there? What resentment is there? What unforgiveness is there? What's going on in my heart? What motives are there that I tolerate that shouldn't be there? What's going on in my heart? Last week, we see how God rejected Saul. And I don't understand it all, obviously, but God chose a man who was good looking, tall, wealthy, and influential. And I think quite possibly that God was just trying to show that that stuff is not what matters because Saul consistently displeased God with his heart. And so I wanna pick up our text, and this is similar to where we left off last week where David is being found by God, Saul is being rejected by God, and we all have these verses on the screen. This is 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14, and this is the prophet Samuel talking to Saul, and this is what he says, but now your kingdom must end, for the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. What does that mean? Pause. The Lord is looking for a person whose heart is like his. It really means this, a heart that mirrors God's heart, a heart that's exactly like God's heart. God is looking for a heart that resembles his own. So it says that he sought after a man after his own heart. The Lord has already appointed him to be the leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. An ironic part about this passage is simply this, that at this time, and if, if you do some simple math about Saul's reign, he reigned 42 years. This is at the beginning of his reign. And David started to rule when he was 30 years old. And so according to that timeline, David at best was a very young, young baby, but most likely hadn't been born yet. So when it says that God sought after a man after his own, after his own heart and had found one, God knew David's heart before he was even born. Acts chapter 13, verse 22 says this, but God removed Saul and replaced him with David, a man about whom God said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. So part of this heart that pleases God is an obedient heart that will do whatever God wants him to do. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7 but the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Put your hand over your heart and let's just pray. Lord, we pray as we talk about the heart that you will shine a light on us right now. Lord, we open our hearts and we say, change us. Father, we want hearts that please you. Holy Spirit, convict us where we're wrong. Encourage us where we're discouraged. Lord, let your word divide us, Lord. Take out what is bad and put in what is good. We open our hearts to you now in Jesus' name, amen. I believe God is looking for three specific things in our hearts. The first type of heart that God is looking for is a heart that desires him, desires him. One of the commands in Deuteronomy is this command. You shall love the Lord your God with all your... It's a command for us to love him. You moms that are here, I know you can bear witness to this. Doesn't it melt your heart when your kids show a desire to be around you, be with you, send you a text? And you know, you want to hear from them today, no matter where they are. Because in that, you're, you're, you're hoping to see a desire in their heart to honor, to, to be close to you. Now, you guys that are young moms, you're probably like, you know, I could get, have a little space, just a little space. But the older those kids get, the more you just, you want to be desired. You want to be, you want them to be close. And God wants the same thing. God is looking for someone who desires him. And in David, God found a young man who passionately loved his presence, loved to be with him. 
David would be out in the fields playing an instrument and just singing to God. I guarantee you God looked down at that young man playing an instrument and singing to him and said, now that's who I want to be king, a man who's after me, a, a person who desires me. And David would sing these psalms, and, and, and I want to read a few of them. And as I put them on the screen, I want you to see the passion in David's heart to be close to the Lord. Psalm 63 verse 1 says, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. Psalm 42, verse 1. As the deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, O God. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I go and stand before him? Psalm verse one, chapter 143, verse 6. I lift my hands to you in prayer. I thirst for you as parched land thirsts for rain. Psalm 27, verse four, the one thing I ask of the Lord, the thing I seek most is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditating in his temple. Psalm 84, verse two, I long, yes, I faint with longing to enter the courts of the Lord. With my whole being, body, and soul, I will shout joyfully to the living God. Can you see David's burning desire for God? He loved his God. Psalm 73, verse 25, whom have I in heaven but you? I desire you more than anything on earth. And so our first reflection on our heart this morning is this. Do you desire God? Do you hunger and thirst for him? I want to stop right now. And I want us all to turn our hearts to the Lord. You know, it's, it's hard to fulfill that command, to love the Lord your God with all your heart. But oftentimes our hearts wander away from the Lord and we don't desire and yearn for him, long for him. And I wanna ask him now, I'm gonna ask the Holy Spirit to put inside of each one of us a hunger, a thirst for our God. Lord, this heart of David which desired you and longed for you. Lord, I pray for each heart that's listening right now. May you put inside of us a, such a hunger to be close to you, such a desire to be near you, oh God. I pray that David's passion for you would be in us, that we would desire you, oh Lord. Do that work in our hearts. Make us hungry for you. Hey, take a moment, if you can, just maybe lift up your hands to God and just say, Lord, fill me with a hunger. Fill me with a thirst for your presence. Fill me with a, with a desire to be near you, to be close to you. Lord, may you do that in each one of us. May we live with a burden. May we live with a passion, Lord, that we would be near you and close to you. Do that in our hearts, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. The second type of heart that I believe God is looking for in each one of us is hearts that align with his. Hearts that align with his. God is looking for somebody that agrees with him. If you've ever been to a chiropractor, a chiropractor, uh, at first you hate him and then you love him. They snap your back and you feel like, that is so wrong. And then you realize, no, that's actually right because you, you're, you, you become aligned. Our hearts get out of alignment with God, which means simply this. We don't think like him, we don't want what he wants, and we don't feel what he feels. But when our hearts get into alignment with his, it means that the things that he desires, we desire. The thoughts that he has, we have those thoughts. And his passions become our passions. And when you look at the world around you, you see how many people disagree with God, his order in life, how he created the universe. You see a complete misalignment of our heart in God's heart. And God is looking for people who agree with him. Is there anybody in the room that just that says, I agree with God? Whatever he says, I am with God, I, I align with God, I agree with God. My wife told me that everybody needs at least one friend that will agree with him no matter what. Even if, they, it, like, if they're mad, I'm mad too. I don't even need to know the story, I'm mad. Ladies, is that true? You just need somebody that will just understand. You don't need a lecture, you just need somebody that will agree with you. God is looking for hearts 
that agree with him. David agreed with God. What God called wicked, David called wicked. What God loved, David loved. This giant who came against the people of Israel, God opposed this giant. God did not like this giant. God was against this giant. But Saul did not carry that same passion. Saul was timid and afraid. But here comes David, and he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that challenges God? And he steps up and his heart is aligned. I want to read in his Psalms how you, you can see his, his alignment of heart. Psalm 119, verse 30. I have chosen to be faithful. I have determined to live by your regulations. Psalm 40, verse 8. I take joy in doing your will, my God, for your instructions are written on my heart. Psalm 19, verse 14. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Psalm 97, verse 10. You who love the Lord hate evil. He protects the lives of godly people and rescues them from the power of the wicked. You know, anytime I find myself disagreeing with God, disagreeing with his word, making apologies for God. And hey, everybody, you need to hear this. When you find yourself apologizing for the God you serve, well, if I, if I was God, I would have done it like this. Or if I were, I don't know why he did it like this, and I disagree with him, your heart is out of line. Anytime you find yourself apologizing for him, disagreeing with him, it shows a heart that's out of alignment with him. You need to love what he loves and hate what he hates. And if he says it's a certain way, it is a certain way. This is a heart that's in alignment. And, and when God found in David a heart that aligned with his, if God gave him a command, David was like, I'm doing it. Whatever you say, I'm doing it. So, Lord, help our hearts align with yours. We don't want our hearts to align with culture. We don't want our hearts to align with what's cool and popular in 2024. Lord, we want to find our hearts aligning with your perspective. So do that work in us, in Jesus' name. The third type of heart that we see in David that I think God is looking for in us is a heart that returns to God. It returns to him. When I was picking one lesson from the life of David to share with all of us, uh, you know, Saul's was insecurity. But for David, I could have chosen the moment where he fell in sin with Bathsheba. And most people would say, why didn't you do that? Because that was a big lesson. Because that really didn't define his life. Or how he took the life of Uriah, the Hittite. Or how he took a survey in, against God's order and brought judgment against Israel. All of these mistakes. Because we all make mistakes. And his life and the lesson of his life is not defined by that, but it's defined in the way that he returned to the Lord even when he mis made mistakes. When we make mistakes, there's three things that we can do that are wrong. First is we can run in shame and act like he doesn't love us and act like he doesn't want to be close to us. We can run in shame. And man, the enemy would love for you to do that. Another thing we can do is harden in rebellion and act like it's no big deal and just say my sin doesn't matter. Or third, we can continue and go deeper in sin because of our love for it. Or we can return to the Lord in humility with brokenness of heart. And on this Mother's Day, you, mom, you moms know that have kids. If your kid makes a mistake and they're, they run in shame, you don't want that from them. You want them to come to you and, and to tell you what happened. You don't want them to run in shame. You definitely don't want to see them harden in rebellion and act like, I don't care. And, and you don't want to see them love that sin and continue doing it. But if they return to you in humility and in brokenness of heart, you're so ready to embrace it. And I'm just telling you, every human that God has ever created has sinned and fallen short. Every single one of us. Even the, the ones that look perfect, we're not perfect. Everybody has sinned and fallen short. But how we respond in those moments is everything. Do you return to the Lord in brokenness of heart and in humility? God is looking for hearts that will quickly come to him and say, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Cleanse me.
Wash away my sins. Let's read David as he expresses this heart in Psalm 51, verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Psalm 32, verse 5. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. And you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. David expressed his repentance to the Lord. I had an experience a few years ago that marked me, and it's worth sharing with you. You know, all of us, we... We judge ourselves by our own intentions and we judge everybody else by their actions. I'll say that, I'll let it sit and I'll say it again. We judge ourselves by our intentions and we judge others by their actions. We all perceive ourselves to be good. We all perceive ourselves to, I'm good enough. My heart's good enough. I was at a conference, a Christian conference, And something about the atmosphere of this conference irritated me. There were different personalities there that I was judgmental of and felt like, yeah, he's got pride or he's, and I was just judging. Is it okay if I tell you this stuff? I was just judging these different, these different personalities and I just had an attitude and I felt myself self-righteous. And as I sat there, it was like, God paused everything and spoke audibly to me. And he said these words, it's your heart, Jonathan. And man, it was like, (laughs) oh man, I saw in my heart traces of envy, self-righteousness, jealousy, these different things in my heart, ambition. And I remember, it was like, with God, everything happens in one second. You don't need 40 minutes with, I mean, it's like, bam. You just, you know. That's how God communicates. It's like, it's all there. I fell to my knees and I just said, Father, remove from me this stuff. It's not them. It's me. It's my heart. Please, Lord, take out of me this, the heart of stone. Take out of me these things that I don't want in my heart. Because you know what? Hearts are like gardens that, spurt, that have weeds that come up. You can weed them one day, and you know what? You walk up the next day, and you say, well, there's more weeds there. That's the human heart. And you have to bring that heart to the Lord and say, Lord, please pull out that unforgiveness. Pull out that pride. Pull out that. And create in me a clean heart, oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. You know? Maybe on this Mother's Day, God wants to do some deep ministry in our hearts where we just say, Lord, purify my heart. How do you, how do you get a clean heart? Well, first, you open up your heart. You, I like to physically lift my hands because it's a symbol of openness to God where you, you lift your hands and you say, Lord, I open my heart to you. Look in, and this is what David said. Examine my heart, O God. Search me and know me. See if there is any sin in my heart. So you open your heart. You surrender your heart to the Lord and allow him to create in you a clean heart. And when the Lord is pleased with your heart, you will fulfill every single thing he has designed for you because he can elevate you, he can walk with you, he can promote you, but if your heart is not right, if your heart's not right, you're on your own. You gotta purify your heart. 